Good morning and welcome to Online Worship. I'm Leslie Anderson. I'm the Director of Connections here and I want to welcome you wherever you are watching us from today. In just a few moments, Pastor Jason will kick off a new message series for Lent, Spirit-Filled Jesus. If you have questions about Crossroads, email me, leslie at washingtoncrossroads.com. Now, I know you're watching online, but we'd love to have you in person as well. We have services at 815 and 10 each and every Sunday, so we'd love to have you join us. But now, let's prepare our hearts for the message. Online Church starts right now. Hey friends, it is so good to be with you today as we launch into a brand new Lenten message series, Spirit-Filled Jesus. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 15. If you want to turn there in your Bible or pull it up on the phone, Luke 3, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke throughout this message series and kind of sink our teeth into some of the great stuff in there. But let me pray before we jump in. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fill our hearts and minds, that you would open your word to us and lead us into the deep waters of the Spirit-filled life. In Jesus' name, amen. So who do you want to be like when you grow up? When I was a preteen, I wanted to be like Weird Al Yankovic when I grew up. I even wore the Hawaiian shirts and everything that he was wearing at the time. When I was in high school, I wanted to be like Eddie Van Halen when I grew up. In my early 20s, when I came back to the Lord, I wanted to be like Pastor Sue White when I grew up. She was the pastor of the little church in Texas that I started attending after college. In my early 30s, I wanted to be like Shane Bishop, my friend and mentor, when I grew up. It's good to have positive role models whose lives we can emulate to take steps toward the fulfillment of who God has created us to be. But part of maturing as Christians is just coming to the agreement with God that the main person that we should all be more like is Jesus himself. We're called to become more and more like Jesus. Now, people interpret this different ways. Certain people are drawn to different aspects of Jesus' life. Some people are drawn to the fact that Jesus spoke truth to power, and so they think we should all do that. Some people are drawn to the way that Jesus fed the poor and cared for the sick, and they say, we need to all do that. Some people are drawn to the way that Jesus hung out with sinners and say, we all need to do that. But one aspect of Jesus's life, which many people miss out on, is that Jesus was filled with, drenched with, dripping with the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we know hardly anything about his life prior to the time when he was baptized by the Holy Spirit and launched into it his spirit-filled, spirit-powered ministry, which would result in his crucifixion and then resurrection. The Gospel of Luke shines really good light on the spirit-filled aspect of Jesus' life and ministry. So during the season of Lent, we're gonna be looking at the life and ministry of Jesus through the lens of the Spirit's empowerment. And today we're looking at the event which kicked the whole thing off. Luke chapter 3, beginning at verse 15. It says, As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Going down to verse 21. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be 
to God. So as we look at this passage today, which describes the baptism of Jesus, I want to answer or try to answer four questions. Number one, why was John baptizing people? Number two, why was Jesus baptized? Number three, what happened when Jesus was baptized? And number four, how does this apply to us? So first, why was John the Baptist baptizing people to begin with? Well, you may remember that John the Baptist was a relative of Jesus. Six months before the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary to tell her that she would become supernaturally inseminated with the Messiah, the Gabriel angel first went to an elderly priest named Zechariah to tell him that his elderly barren wife, Elizabeth was going to become pregnant in her old age with a son that they were to name John, who would come in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord. He would be the prophet whose coming and ministry was foretold in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Malachi. He would be the forerunner of the Messiah. And so now John is about 30 years old, and he appears in the wilderness with this ministry calling people of Israel to repent of their sin and turn to God. It says in Luke 3, verse 3, he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this was super significant because the people of Israel hadn't had a prophet from God in hundreds of years who spoke like this. Also, what he was calling them to do required great humility and self-reflection because baptism was normally something that was done to people who were being initiated into the Jewish faith, not people who were already Jewish. And so John was telling them that just being Jewish didn't mean that they were right with God. Just being a descendant of Abraham or being circumcised did not mean that they were prepared for the coming judgment and for the coming of the Messiah. And as John preached this message, the Holy Spirit moved so mightily through him. It says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Then all Jerusalem and Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So this was a huge move of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just a guy out there yelling. It was God moving among the people and working through John. And when we, again, when we follow the Holy Spirit's pings in our lives, we do what God calls us to do, and then he does what only he can do. You know, it was a year ago that Asbury University was experiencing that ginormous move of God, which really affected the whole world. On February 8th, there was a run-of-the-mill chapel service on Asbury University's campus. And then afterward, some students felt called to stick around and keep worshiping and confessing their sins and praying. And then more started coming. Within a few days, about 15,000 people a day were coming to worship and repent and seek God at Asbury University. Well, that revival lasted 144 hours. I got to go and be a part of it just as they were closing it down. The town could not hold all the people that were coming, and the students really needed to get back to class, so they ended up tying it up. It could have gone on forever, it seemed. But it now, looking back, during that time, 50 to 70,000 people visited Wilmore, Kentucky, representing 200 academic institutions, more than 200, and representing multiple countries. Just as the spirit blew in Wilmore last year, the spirit blew during the preaching and the ministry of John the Baptist, but in an even bigger way, calling the nation of Israel to repentance and confession to be restored to God and to be ready for the Messiah. But the second question in our text is, so why was Jesus baptized? I mean, Jesus clearly wasn't a sinner who needed to repent in order to get right with God. So what was going on here? 
Well, we read in the Gospel of Matthew that John himself was confused, that when Jesus stepped up to be baptized, John realized what was going on and who he was, and he felt like it wasn't even appropriate for him to be baptized. It says in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 15, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. So why was Jesus being baptized by John? Well, theologians have offered many different uh, thoughts around why Jesus was being baptized, even though he wasn't a sinner in need of repentance. One thought is that Jesus came to fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law on behalf of sinners. And so since none of us could fully satisfy God's requirements, Jesus satisfied them on our behalf and then offered himself to die in our place. And when John started calling all people to repent, it became a righteous requirement of God. And so Jesus needed to fulfill that requirement as well. That's one idea. Another idea is that Jesus was baptized by John so that he could publicly identify with the awakening of John, with the revival of John the Baptist. He didn't want people to think that he was opening something up in competition to John, and he wanted people to know that he was the fulfillment of John's ministry and that he was um, the continuation of it. So he wanted to be identified with it. And another reason that theologians have suggested is that Jesus had to be baptized to fully identify with the sinful human race that he came to save. He would identify with sinners through baptism so that he could die in our place as the Son of God, who is also the sinless Son of Man and Messiah. Now, all of those ideas have merit and are worthy of consideration. But one reason we know for sure that he was baptized was so that he could be identified to John as the Messiah. Just as Jesus walked up to be baptized, John started to feel who he truly was, but then God had also prearranged a sign that would take place so that John would truly know who the Messiah was. And so in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, we read about something that took place shortly after Jesus was baptized by John, but while he was still hanging out down at the river with John and the other folks that were there. It says in John 1, beginning of verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know it was him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know as him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And so John said, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So this was a prearranged sign that God would give John so that John would know that the one who had baptized with the Holy Spirit, that the Son of God had arrived. So this brings us to our third question, and that is, what happened when Jesus was baptized by John? I mean, things really started to pop at this point. Well, I don't claim to know everything that happened, but let me share with you three gigantic things that absolutely happened. First, at this point, Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, oil often symbolizes the Holy Spirit of God. And in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil at the inauguration of their service. And so check out this passage from 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13, which describes how the prophet Samuel went to anoint David to 
tell him that he would become the next king of Israel. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Or check out Psalm 133, which describes the beautiful anointing with oil of Aaron as the first high priest of Israel. It says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. Now the word Messiah or Christos, translated into English as Christ, it means anointed one. So all of those Old Testament anointings with oil foreshadowed the Messiah who would come to restore the people of Israel, whom the Lord would anoint with the Holy Spirit in power. And this is what happens. It says in Luke 3, 21 and 22, when Jesus had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. John the Baptist got to visibly see with his eyes this anointing with Jesus as the Messiah. Later, when Peter was speaking about Jesus to some non-Jewish people whom God was calling to himself, he said in Luke chapter 10, verse 38, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. A second thing that happened when Jesus was baptized is that he was launched into his public ministry. It says in verse 23, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years old. Now, no one is more of an expert on this spirit-filled life of Jesus and that God is calling us to than the late, great Jack Hayford. And this is what he says about this event. He said, Jesus' ministry didn't begin until he received his anointing as Messiah, the empowering that came through the descent of the Holy Spirit upon him. Though conceived and born by the Spirit's power and sinless his whole lifetime, he did not attempt ministry without the Spirit's power. He insisted John baptize him, not for repentance, but because he knew the Holy Spirit would come upon him at that time. From that time, he is led by the Holy Spirit and moves into ministry, declaring the presence of God's kingdom in manifesting its miracles, signs, and wonders. So one more beautiful thing that happened when Jesus was baptized by John is that God the Father affirmed him from heaven. Verse 22 says, And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. So why was this thundering voice from heaven necessary? And who was it really for? Well, according to Luke's gospel, it was God the Father speaking directly to Jesus. And why wouldn't he do this? Why wouldn't he say this to Jesus at this pivotal point in Jesus' earthly life, after which he would be propelled into a very tumultuous three-year ministry where he would immediately be assaulted by Satan and temptation and critics? And so if you and I need to hear our fathers say, I love you, how much more would Jesus at this point in history benefit from hearing this. So in addition to reading my Bible each day, this year I'm also reading this little daily book called The Daily Dad by Ryan Holiday. And in the month of February, Ryan Holiday is emphasizing every day how our kids need unconditional love from us. It's the most important thing. And he started off the month of February by talking about Bruce Springsteen's story with this matter. He writes, in his beautiful and vulnerable memoir, Bruce Springsteen writes that his father said fewer than a thousand words to him throughout his entire childhood. He reasoned, maybe I'm not greeted with love and affection because I haven't earned it. So for decades, Bruce tried anything to earn his father's love. 
In the 1980s, in his 30s, with a few Grammys to his name, Bruce began to struggle with depression. He wasn't exactly sure why. He'd accomplished more than he dreamed. As an artist, he was beloved by millions and was started to be discussed in the same conversations as his idols, Elvis, Dean, Dylan. As a son, a man, a human being, things couldn't have been more different. He felt completely alone. In that loneliness, Bruce picked up the strange habit of driving through his childhood neighborhood. After years of cruising old haunts, Bruce writes, I eventually got to wondering, what the H-E-double-L am I doing? So he went to see a psychiatrist who didn't need the background story to know that Bruce was sensing that something had gone wrong, and now he was trying to fix it. But the doctor said, well, you can't. You can't go back. So from the outside, it looked like Bruce Springsteen had everything. On the inside, he felt like he had nothing. It's evidence of our power as parents. No amount of money or celebrity or awards can substitute for your love to your children. So on this occasion, as God the Father was anointing Jesus with the Holy Spirit, and Jesus was being revealed to Israel as the Messiah, the Son of God, the sacrifice that would pay for the sins of all people, God the Father thundered from heaven these beautiful words of affirmation. You are my child. You are so loved. I am so pleased with you. So the final question is, how does this apply to us? Well, first, we all need to identify with Jesus through baptism. In the book of Matthew, the last thing that Jesus gives is this thing called the Great Commission. And he says in chapter 28, verse 19, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus identified with the sinful human race through his baptism, we are called to publicly identify with Jesus through our being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Within the Methodist tradition, we honor all of the ancient modes of baptism, sprinkling, pouring, and full immersion. We baptize some people who are presented to their, by their parents, and we baptize them as babies, and some who haven't been baptized, we baptize as believers when they come to know Jesus. Now at Crossroads, since we don't have a way on a regular basis to baptize people with immersion, once a year we bring in a horse trough and fill it with warm water, and then we offer an opportunity for anyone that needs to be baptized to be baptized. And if they want to be immersed in baptism, they can do that. And so this year, our horse trough baptism Sunday will be April 14th. If you are a part of Crossroads and you want to sign up to be baptized on Horse Trough Sunday, you can email Leslie at WashingtonCrossroads.com and everyone will have a chance to remember or reaffirm their baptism on that day as well. So be listening throughout this Lenten season. If you need to publicly identify with Jesus through baptism, if God is pinging you to take this step, do it. Number two, we all need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Just as Jesus didn't launch into his ministry until he had been baptized by the Holy Spirit, we all have our own ministries to fulfill in Jesus' name, but we also need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do so. And John the Baptist said that the main thing that Jesus came to do was to baptize with the Holy Spirit. I mean, that's how he advertised Jesus. This is what he's going to do. Get ready. This is what he's coming to do. And so Jesus told his disciples uh, before he ascended back to heaven, you have been baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And then on the day of Pentecost, they were all baptized with the Holy Spirit and they launched into 
fulfilling Jesus' ministry and doing the same things that he had done. At Crossroads, we believe that God wants every Christian filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit because we all have ministry to do. We all need to reach the lost around us. We all need to invite people into the family. So if you sense that you need more of the Holy Spirit's power in your life, use this Lenten season to seek God through repentance, fasting and prayer, and asking for the Holy Spirit to clothe you with power from on high. And as you seek the Holy Spirit's empowerment in your life, remember the promise of Jesus from Luke chapter 11, verse 13, where he said, if you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Third, we all need to experience the Father's love. We can't all sing and dance like Bruce Springsteen, but we all need to know that we are deeply loved by our Father if we are going to be whole and be healed in this life. And many of us uh, didn't have fathers that showed us unconditional love. And many of us, maybe we long to hear our fathers say it, but they've passed on and they can't say it anymore. Whatever the reason is, we all need the Father's healing and holiness to flow within us and touch us. This is one of the reasons why the cross of Jesus Christ is so important. It's a constant visual reminder of how much the Father loves us. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when you see the cross, you need to see that as a, as a billboard from God the Father showing you, reminding you how much you are loved, how much the Son loves you that He would pay for your sins so that you could be reconciled to the Father in His love. But beyond just cognitively comprehending that we're loved, we also need to feel the love of God. We need the Holy Spirit to speak to our spirit that we are children of God and we are loved. And although we can't really control when the Holy Spirit touches us in that way, We can ask God to reveal his love to us. So I thought I would take a minute and just pray for you and ask God the Father to speak to you today and tell you that he loves you and that you would feel it in the depths of your heart and you would know that your Father loves you and that Jesus loves you and died for you. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would speak now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak in the hearts of the people who are listening or watching. Let them feel your love. Let them know it in their heart, in the depths of who they are. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us with the confidence of loved children of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us declare together what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.